This is Bolus Maximus. I'm Brandon. And I'm Matt. Thanks for tuning in. This is my first time hosting a podcast. How about you? Uh, yo, yeah, for sure. Any idea how we're supposed to get people to listen and subscribe to this podcast? Just by, like, saying it? Subscribe, 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 subscribe. You're tuned in to Bolus Maximus with Brandon and Matt. Don't forget to comment, share, and smash that like button to stay up to date. All right, welcome back to Bolus Maximus. My name is Matt. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm here with my co-host, Brandon. Hey, how's it going? Thanks for joining us, everybody. We've got a very special guest today. We are really excited to welcome Laquisha Umemba, and she is currently the CEO of Umemba Health and uh, a co-founder of Diversity in Diabetes. Welcome, Laquisha. Hello. Hello, Matt, and hello, Brandon. Thank you for having me on the podcast today. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, we are very excited to have you. So thank you so much for giving us a little bit of your time. And unfortunately for everybody at home listening, in your car, on your walk, you may not be able to see us, but we can see each other here and it's very nice to connect in person over Zoom. So we're gonna ask you some questions after we give a little introduction and and that way our our listeners can learn a little bit more about you. So uh, Quisha, if you wouldn't mind, quick quick background on yourself. from 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 you all righty thank you well as um as you just said my name is la quisha umemba i just go by quisha or my close friends call me q Uh, i am a registered nurse of 13 years but i've been in the medical field oh god uh, probably about 20 22 years started out as a candy striper at 16 and then went on to be a medical assistant then an associate's in nursing, bachelor's in nursing, master's in public health, and I've got about, ugh, I don't know, three or four certifications as well, but I won't mention them all. Uh, I am a lifelong learner, and more than learning, I love teaching. I think that's the best way to continue to learn anyway. Um, I have worked everywhere, um, probably except for um, a surgical unit. So I've worked in SICU, which is Surgical Intensive Care Unit, I've done moonlighting in hospitals. I've done moonlighting in palliative and hospice care. Um, And I went, probably the last thing I did clinically was working in outpatient clinic, uh, an endocrinology clinic, and that's where I was introduced to diabetes. Even though I had patients that had diabetes for a very, very long time, it really, really um, wasn't something that was on my radar until I went to work in an endocrinology clinic. So I spent about three years there. Um, was an adjunct instructor for our inpatient and outpatient diabetes education programs and decided, well, maybe I should get a certification and, and as a certified diabetes educator. So that term has just recently changed, like you said, to certified diabetes care and education specialist. I've been that for about five years. I just renewed this year. Uh, and in addition to all of the professional uh, and career things that I just mentioned, I'm also CEO and founder of Umemba Health LLC. So at Umemba Health, we elevate the multidimensional skill set of the frontline workforce. And basically what that means is I provide continuing education and professional development for people that are on the front line, the boots on the ground in healthcare and public health. So this is community health workers, this is medical assistants, nursing assistants, pharmacy techs, um, front desk clerks. These are the people that um, don't really tend to get that much experience and exposure when we're talking about the medical field. You hear people talk about nurses and nurse practitioners and doctors all the time, but not a lot about community health workers and and nurses aides and so forth. So uh, I've been doing that for right at a year. A few months ago, uh, a friend of mine, we I co-created the People of Color Living with Diabetes Summit. And out of that summit, a couple of weeks after we finished, came Diversity in Diabetes, which is a new nonprofit. And I'd love to tell you more about it as we continue our talk tonight. Is there anything you don't do? Uh, do you have time for yourself? Uh, do you have time to do your hair? Your hair looks great. i like, how do you have time to do that? Like, that's, that is amazing. Uh, Quisha, thank you so much. That is what you do for the community, right? Thank you from two individuals who benefit from what you do for other individuals like ourselves, but you do so much more. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, You know what? I have to say this. Thank you, too. Okay, so you're like the third male compliment today. Uh, My husband came home and he said, do I have lunch for tomorrow? And I said, 
not right now, but you will by 10 o'clock tonight. <laughs> and he said, and I said, you know, I'm really, I'm getting tired of cooking. Like you, you know, you've got to help me out. And my husband is, is Nigerian. He's, he's a new immigrant. He's only been in the States for about four years. He does not cook American food. And, uh, and he said, I know, babe, I know it's stressful, but you do such a good job. And he said that someone at work said, is your wife, a, is, is she like a stay at home wife? Because I literally cook every single day and he takes his lunch every single day. So I thought it was such a sweet compliment that he gave me and that he told me that his coworker said, and now you two just complimented me. And I'm like, okay, go men. I appreciate that. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, your, your hard work doesn't go unnoticed uh, at all. Um, I'm going to kind of, I'm going to kind of jump into this thing though. Uh, one, I remember speaking with you before uh, the POCLWD, uh, and you had said something to me, and I said, you know, I, I identify as African American, and then you you gave me a quick rundown on your husband, and I was like, okay, well, maybe maybe I'm just black, maybe I, you know, maybe maybe I, maybe I am just black, you know. So uh, I thought that I thought that was cool, but uh, hopefully one day we'll get to we'll get to meet him as well. I, I got to know, how did you meet him? You said he's only been in we the met, We met on okcupid.com. It was the dating app. Uh, and it's so funny, too, because when I, and, and we're way off topic, but I'm sure your, your <laughs> listeners are going to enjoy this conversation. Um, yeah, so I remember calling my mom saying, um, and I was married 16, 15 and a half years before I met my husband. So I, I was with my ex since 18. So that the dating scene was completely different. I mean, I, I'm not doing it anymore. Like y'all can have it. I'm not doing that anymore. And uh, I remember calling my mom and I said, mom, I met someone and he asked me to go to church with him. And she was like, where did you meet him? Please don't tell me it was one of those online dating sites. And, and I got quiet and she was like, I knew it. I knew it. I'm like, mama, that's really the only place to meet people these days. So anyway, it, it worked out. It, I had to kiss a few frogs, though. So God bless. That's great. Hey, I'm long happy it, for you. Long as, it, long as it worked out. That, that's all we it care about. Out. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful, Cresha. So thank you so much. That, that's, it's amazing to, to have you on. And, and as we, we build what Bolus Maximus uh, is in our minds, uh, Brandon and I, that is our, our minds, uh, what we see it as we've started to understand under individuals like yourself, you also see something like what Bolus Maximus could be. So we'll get into that. Let's hit you with yeah. some quick fire, like rapid fire questions. These are fun. They're not necessarily diabetes, uh, diabetes related. They're just, let's just have some fun with it. All right. So go, go for it. I love it. Brandon's going to go first. Football or baseball? Football. Wine or whiskey? Depend on the day of the week. <laughs> <laughs> Both. Okay, that's an acceptable answer. Truck or sports car? Sports car. Tacos or hamburgers? I'm in Texas. Tacos. Camping or beach getaway? Beach getaway. I'm a pluviophile. That means I'm a lover of all things water. Okay. Fanny pack or backpack? Oh, I'm getting older. Fanny packs. <laughs> yeah. I'm with oh, you. Wait. Heels or sneakers? Oh, this tendonitis will not let me be great, so I'm going to say sneakers. Okay, ear pods or over-the-ear headphones? <sighs> ear pods. Follow change or create change? Create. I'm a visionary. Uh, boys to men or 112? I see you. Looking at me. I'm going to be, I'm going to go. <laughs> All right. Ice cream sundae or ice cream sandwich? Ice cream sundae. Brisket or ribs? Oh, brisket's lean. I'll go with that all day. So this next one, uh, uh, this is, I asked my brother, uh, you're, you're currently in Austin, Texas. So I asked my brother to the best, barbecue places and he said franklin's and valentina's never eaten it either i've only okay. been in austin a year okay so i can't tell you so which we're gonna one. skip that what, what, what okay. about riskies have you ate at riskies no have not oh man 
We're gonna. Skip. I just told y'all I cook every day. I know, I know. Well, I, think I don't know. I, you know, every once in a while. Okay, we're coming to we're coming to Austin. We're going to Sixth Street. That's okay. Oh, come on. We got all right. We got two more questions: cake or cookies? Cake, birthday or wedding? Mm. Music. I'm so specific with my. With, I like yes. it. I like it though. I like no. it. M music or a book? And that depends on the mood. Okay. Both. Both. Except acceptable answer. Given your a desire to continue learning, uh -huh. seems like maybe yeah. you'd like that book, but I can see with some headphones on kicking back. So we we thank you. Uh, it's just a way for us to ask some questions. I like that. I love that. Yeah. That <laughs> right. was fun. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so so let's uh, you know two of the things here. You're from Arkansas originally. I'm a uh, Razorback. That is true. Northern. Mm -hmm. And then. Do you have qual? You, no, no, Michi no, no, Michi no. Michigan, just, Michigan State has got something to one say. Of, one of a couple coaches that I know coach there. So that that's it. The the, the Arkansas okay. Razorback. Good people in Arkansas. Good. Yeah. Yeah. And then you've only been in Texas for a year. Were you somewhere else? No, I've been in Texas. So I moved to Houston as the chief nurse um, of the Office of Crime, Disease, and Prevention at the Houston Health Department. I did that for four years. Okay. And then I was offered a job here in Austin. So we moved about a year ago. Nice. How has that relocation been? You know what? We actually just fell in love with Austin. Um, and it's, <laughs> and it's, I guess I could have fallen in love with it sooner, but I thought the traffic and the commute would be better than Houston. But it's so many people in such a small space. Um, there are definitely some pros of COVID-19 because half the people are off the street now because most everybody works or goes to school from home. And for me, quality of life is so much better that I'm not spending so much time in the car. Um, so we actually just decided, like, we think Austin is where we're going to, you know, plan our roots. Yeah. Nice. Like that. Congrats. Everything's bigger in Texas. Yes. Yeah. Texas is nice. So you gave us uh, just your resume is, uh, I would say impressive, but that's an understatement. You're <laughs> quite diverse. Your background is very diverse. And it seems like diabetes wasn't the main focus, but now obviously it is your focus given your, your certification. What was that like? Could you tell us like, you know, what was that transition like for you? Like how did, how did diabetes become that focal point? Mm -hmm. So when I went to go work in the endocrinology clinic, I thought, okay, I'm going to go and I'm going to deal with a lot of like growth tumors and hormone issues and um, things like that. And when I went and, and at this time I worked, when I started my nursing career, the first 10 years as a nurse, um, I was at the VA hospital in, in Little Rock, Arkansas. And so serving the veterans there, I went to work at the endocrinology clinic. And even though I was exposed to a lot of endocrinolo endocrinology disorders, probably about 70, 80% of the patients um, were, had diabetes. And, I, and that just blew me away. I just did not correlate the endocrinology clinic and diabetes. I, it, I it just, even though we learned it in school, I just did not think that majority of the patients, eight out of 10 patients a day that I saw would have diabetes. And so when you're seeing eight out of 10 patients a day or 18 out of 20 a day and they have diabetes, it automatically becomes your specialty. Like you, that's what you get used to dealing with day in and day out. Um, so for me, it just, it, I was at a point in my life where I didn't think I need a third nursing degree. I have associates that have a bachelor's. I didn't want a master's in nursing. And I'm always a plan B type of person. So if my license gets taken away and I have three nursing degrees, then what am I going to be able to do? Uh, and at the time, because I like to stay on top of things, I kept seeing MPH behind doctor's names. I would always see MD, MPH, MD, MPH. What is this? What is this? So I Googled, I talked to my, um, my supervisor at the time, who was an endocrinologist, and she was like, you got to get an MPH. You got to go and get your master's. If you like diabetes and you love population health, this is what you want to do. And so it was just a natural fit. You know, a nurse that loves community health and population health um, going to transition to focus on, on public health just seemed to be a natural fit. Um, but I will say that diabetes is not my day in and day out now. I haven't been clinical in probably seven or eight years. I have worked in diabetes from either an administrative or a consultative role, specifically when it comes to developing diabetes program, making sure they're sustainable, um, 
Um, the program that I managed in Houston was funded by seven different funding sources, so a lot of grant writing, a lot of reporting, things like that. Um, so I'm not day to day, you know, dealing with um, uh, calculations and you know consulting with patients like that. Now I have a much more global view, and I'm really focused on the population health aspect of diabetes, especially with uh, in people of color. I, and I think that's huge too, um, you know, because I think when we talk people of color, a lot of things get overlooked. But if you look, if you break down statistic wise, um, when we when we speak of like type two diabetes, there are a lot of African Americans or, you know, and people of color that fall under that category that don't necessarily get the adequate healthcare education. Uh, and, you know, I think just information in general, you know, and I think there are cultural differences, um, but at the same time, I still think they should be able to live their best life possible. Now, I, I do know that you, I don't know if you currently have, if you're a pre-diabetic, but I know that you were at stages of being uh, pre-diabetic. Is that still? No, I, no, I have pre-diabetes okay. and as of last week, so does my husband. So yeah. I was going to bring that up during the conversation because I know we're going to talk about men and, um, and men with, and having diabetes. So yes, I do have pre-diabetes. So, so with, the, with you having pre-diabetes and I believe your father also had type 2 diabetes and your aunt has type 1, uh, obviously what you're doing now, it you were already impacted on a personal level and you already had a passion for really just jumping in and, and kind of helping out far as the community goes. But, but now it even hits home even more now, even, even with that statement of your husband being a pre-diabetic, you know, now I know you, I, I haven't known you for that long, but I know, I know how you are and how serious you are about making an impact and making a change in the community. So like we're like, I, I'm, I'm just curious to see like how with your family members and obviously your husband now, you know, being impacted by like, like kind of where does this shift now for you? First of all, you, you hit it on the head when you talked about um, the, the differences in, in, in communities of color, especially when it comes to education. It really wasn't until maybe two years ago or maybe not even two years ago. It was a few months before I actually started my business. So I didn't say that the first iteration of Umemba Health, probably for the first six months of my business, I was actually doing private client education and group classes. So that's how I started. And this is, this is what happened. I was consulting. I was the diabetes nurse consultant for the state of Texas. I was consulting with healthcare systems and organizations on how to implement virtual diabetes programs. And I'm a bit stubborn. For me, it was like, it can't be this hard, right? So I actually started doing it so I could just like, it, it can't be this hard. It's, it's not as difficult as people are making it seem. And I was taking and applying what I was learning and things that I was doing with my private clients and using that to consult with these organizations. So, you know, in, in laying the groundwork for that, I was talking to my sister one day and my sister lives with my parents and she said, oh, by the way, um, dad wants to know what is that number they keep asking him about that A1C? And I said, wait a minute, daddy, daddy has had type 2 diabetes for two years, and I'm a certified diabetes educator. What do you mean? What is that A1C number? It blew my mind. I, first of all, I was so down on myself, because I was like, first of all, what kind of educator are you, okay? But then it also was such a good lesson, because I think that we think patients are okay if they get a two-hour session, or they get the six-week series, you have to be a constant student of diabetes. Um, and so I think that's yeah. so important that you said that. That's the number one thing is that I've learned that I have to continuously learn for myself and learn for my husband and for my dad and for my aunt. I remember doing an interview on an on a internet news uh, station a couple of years ago, and my aunt, who's had diabetes probably 35 years, I gave an analogy. I actually had a cup with me and I put some sugar in and I talked about how, you know, imagine if you had this, you know, um, you know, this going through your bloodstream and how it would clog up your, your, your vessels and what it would do to your eyes and kidneys and so on. And just that visual analogy, she called me and she said, I've been, a, I've had diabetes for 35 years. I've never understood it like that. Never. You have to be a lifelong learner of diabetes. So first and foremost, that's, what is most relevant for me is the education piece. 
and you, you're and not to be so forward. I think the, the way you answered, the way you said, there's been a change I, I, just visually. I don't know. We have, this is the first time I've ever spoke, spoken to you. Just the way you just mentioned that your husband has been diagnosed and that, you know, two years or however long it was ago that you had spoken about your father and so on. It just seems like you're, it, you're prepared. You're ready to help even your own family now, which as you know, somebody who usually works in this space, that's not what they're usually doing. So that's a lot to do it outside, facilitate, administrate, and then come home and still do that. So uh, we'll be sending you a bottle or a case of wine or something. Um, so and, and that's, it's amazing because especially now with, with the, um, you know, the people of color living with diabetes, uh, you've really broken ground, truly broken ground and and uh watching brandon and, and yourself uh during that summit was like give me the goosebumps like just to see somebody that i get to sit i'm sitting next to him right now but somebody that i'm <laughs> all the time uh we we've been working on this for a long time and to see things really start taking action uh is is really great uh, and those communities that that brandon was alluding to and that you've spoken about we're coming for you we're coming for you and and you know and then just to piggyback off of what Matt said, you know, it, it, it feels good. And, and I mean, it's from the bottom of my heart to really, to really connect with individuals that are really trying to drive change. We understand that there's been issues. It's been overlooked for far too long. Uh, but the only, the only way that you bring about change is to keep pressing forward no matter what. And I think there are a lot of people out there. And I said this, prior to our, our recording, uh, what you're doing is something that hasn't been done. So you're always going to get backlash from s certain community members, certain organizations, but you're not doing it to fight against them. You're doing it to let them know that we're here. And no matter how much money you have, no matter what color you are, no matter how you grew up, diabetes affects everybody period. Yeah. And we all need help. I'm, I'm 17 years in. I still need help from time to time. And it's okay to say that. But I think sometimes we overlook it and we think that is not important. But health is wealth. You know, I know cliches, people say that's cliche, but cliches are cliches for a reason. Like people keep saying them for a reason. Like health is wealth. Like I don't care how much money you have if you don't take care of your health and it, like you can't do anything you you'll you'll end up it, it may not affect you now but it'll affect you later and i think by the courses you're putting on by the summit the summits that you're holding like this is this isn't just something that's going to be temporary it's going to be yeah. annual like you said it's going to yeah, be absolutely. Annual. absolutely and i'll even go so far as to say this you know I had a, when I was contemplating going back to get my master's, I was like, oh, I don't need any more student loans. I had an a, a endocrinologist that I was working with, and he said, Quisha, there's three things you don't worry about collecting um, debt over. And I said, what's that? And he said, you don't worry about the IRS. They're going to be there. Don't worry about it. You don't worry about student loans, because if you don't have education, you don't have quality of life, and you don't worry about collecting medical bills. He said, because if you don't go to the doctor, if you don't get yourself treated, he said, you're not going to have quality of life anyway. And that has always stuck with me. He was like, you're going to die owing either the IRS, some <laughs> medical bills, or some student loans. So don't let it stress you. Sure. So I always, I always say that whenever we talk about, like, you know, health, it really is wealth. And it's so important that, and, and I understand that it's not the case for everybody, right? We have people that can't afford their medications and can't afford, you know, Medicaid, medical supplies and things like that. But, uh, and, and, and that's what we're going to be working with diabetes and diversity to kind of advocate for some of those things and help people understand that. But yeah, health is definitely wealth. I agree with you there. So I 100% I agree with you. And I think what you're doing somehow, we definitely as Bolas Maxims, we want to figure out how we can help out in any capacity, but, I want to ask you this, where do you, where, where's the most action needed? Like when we talk about implementing things into the community, whether it's education, advocacy, uh, support, um, be, because 
you know, these things, you know, especially with this, with this pandemic that's happening, uh, we're all so isolated, but we still need that information. We still need that support. We still need that guidance, you know? So what, like, what, what would you say the most action is needed as far as in the diabetes space, the community? Well, first of all, I'll say this to people that, that mentioned something about isolation. I personally don't think we've ever been more connected than we are now. We don't have to be in the same room to be connected. And I actually think we can get a lot more done now um, than ever because it's virtual. Like you don't have to get in the car, you don't have to drive, you don't have to worry about traffic, you don't have to worry about transportation or, you know, there's so many barriers that are removed. Now, mind you, you have to have a good internet. I think I've got 12 devices hooked up to mine and it's tripping. I'm gonna have to go to the next tier. But I say all that to say um, the, 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 this is the best time, the best time to reach or scale services to reach a, a, a large number of people. Um, for me, I think that, uh, and I'm going to quote Sharice, um, when she says we need to make diabetes good trouble, I think we've been quiet for a long time. And I think that um, there's been enough, I'm actually going to repeat something that I said to, um, at a JDRF advisory, um, meeting on Tuesday. Um, but there's been enough talk, you know, one of the questions was, you know, where do you get your insights and data and, and this and this? And I was like, there's enough research. There's been enough studies. There's been enough trials, not enough black people in them, but you know, or brown people, but we got the numbers. You can open any diabetes, all these diabetes journal articles I have here, you can open it and get it. Let's go to the people. Let's ask them what they want. Let's ask them what's most important to them. Let's, let's not just forget um, going in the communities um, of color that are affected the most and asking them what they think. But from my uh, professional standpoint, what I see is we've got a serious lack of referral to basic diabetes service. So if a person is diagnosed with diabetes, it's not up for, to the provider to say, well, Ms. Jones has, she's a single black mother and she's got four kids and she works two jobs and I know she's not gonna go anyway, so I'm not gonna refer her. That's not your decision. Refer everyone, period. That's it, refer everyone, period. Because we've already established a two hour class or a six week class is not gonna be enough. Ms. Jones, if she's just diagnosed with diabetes, we need to get her the information as soon as possible and she needs to be working with someone you know on a consistent basis so she can prevent those complications so i would definitely see, say first and foremost we got to do something with education okay we also have to do something uh, about the lack of awareness of diabetes treatment options and diabetes technology especially in uh, people of color um, there are too many great devices insulin pumps cgms um, I even just found out a couple of months ago that there was pre-mixed um, glucagon, pre-filled, pre-mixed glucagon. I was like, oh, Quisha, you've been out the game a long time because you don't, <laughs> you don't even know what all is available anymore. And I'm like, you know, those are the type of things that our patients need to be aware of. Um, and so another thing I would say is we definitely need more representation. I think that when we have more black and brown doctors, black and brown nurses, black and brown educators, not only do our patients feel um, more trusting of us, making them uh, communicate better, disclose information better, but also we, if I'm taking care of a, a, a black person from the South, I identify with them 100%. I'm not gonna have a bias against them when they say they drank flower water to try to cure their diabetes, their, their you know, diabetes or diarrhea or whatever it is. You know, If they come in and say they have a boil and they put salt pork on it, I'm not going to talk about it because grandma always said put salt pork on the ball and draw the head out, you know, but there are some doctors in some cultures that are going to be like, you did what? That's non-compliance. That's not adherent. No, that's a very motivated, engaged patient that used traditional home remedies to try to take care of something because they didn't have the money or the resources or the know-how. And so I definitely think we need more diverse representation we need more educators that look like me and look like you. And, and, and like I said, people need to know, um, they need good sound education right off the bat, not 10 years into their diagnosis when they're already, you know, 25, 30% vision loss and kidney loss and all that other stuff right off the bat. And then we have to make people aware of their treatment options and diabetes technology that's available. For sure. And I'll, and, and I think that's great. Uh, but I, I also want to, you know, and you can correct me if I'm wrong. 
when I was diagnosed, I was literally in the hospital from like 5 p.m. and I was released, discharged at 8 p.m. and 8, 8 a.m. in the morning. And for me, the, the nurses, they checked like every half an hour to make sure I was checking my blood sugar, things like that. They gave me a ton of books to read and I read them. I'm honestly saying 17 years later, I probably should have been held in that hospital a lot longer just because the magnitude of this disease, you will not get it in one night. No. Like mentally, I, you know, I'm 17 years old. It's like, look, one, I hate hospitals. I wanted to get out of there. But at the same time, the thought process is like, let me just read all this information. Let me understand it. Let me know how to give myself shots. Let me know how to check my blood sugar. Let me get out of here. You know, and that's exactly what happened. But I think, um, you know, and you can answer this. Do you think that, you know, out the gate, I think the education starts immediately from that when that person is diagnosed. Like, I think that should be the the form or the structure or, or some type of foundation set up so that individual doesn't fail. You still got to accept the fact, right? It's It doesn't sink in right away. You, you can't start to learn about something that you haven't truly accepted. And I think a lot of people, it takes a long time to accept the fact that you have diabetes. And, and, and not to, we were diagnosed at the same time. So him and I, uh, the example you just used is a single mother, a, a black single mother. Him and I, we, we were 16 and 17 years old. We didn't have anything else to do. We, we had all the time to learn about it, and we didn't use that time appropriately. Right. And, and that's, that's hard to think about at, at 33 and 34. Well, you know, and that kind of comes with age, right? And I think okay. I, I said it, and um, oh, I can't remember what session it is, but I talked about the importance of the parent and not letting the teenager, you know, control their diabetes. But I will answer uh, Brandon's question. Brandon, I don't think the hospital is where the education needs to take place. Um, I think um, very much, like you said, Matt, you're sick. You're not feeling good. There's so much going on. Somebody just tells you you have a life altering, um, life forever self-managing condition. That's not going to be the best place for you to learn. You're definitely going to need good follow-up. You're going to need a warm a, a referral and a warm handoff. And I think that education needs to take place outpatient. And also from a business standpoint, they got to churn bids. You're not going to stay there. They got to make money and generate revenue. So we're not going to let you sit here while you get it together. They are going to treat you and treat you. And that's just the truth, the truth of it. I think maybe then, you know, and, and appropriately, and I appreciate you saying that. I think the same way Brandon does too. We're like, get him in the hospital, give him a binder, let's go. That's obviously not how things are going to work, but we would love to see that. I, I think hearing what you've just said and the way that Brandon and I have had our conversations, then that initial inpatient experience needs to be better. It needs to be, there needs to be more warmth. There needs to be, as Anna Barish, our other CDCES uh, guest said, there needs to be a big hug from the, the healthcare community. Somebody needs to show up and say, hey, we're, we're here. We're normal people. We're not trying to discharge you right away. Um, so we're, we're, you know, Brandon and I, we've got, uh, we've got the sights on the future looking at 2021. How can we work with Umemba Health? Lucretia, yeah. you directly. Uh, we, we, we have a lot of communities that we're looking to, to diversity and diabetes. To benefit. <laughs> oh, we, yeah. They need yeah. a benefit from the actions that we're looking to take. Um, yeah. Well, that all sounds exciting. Just let me know. I'm ready. We are ready. So, so as a, uh, as you know, Bolus Maximus is something that we've been trying to do is, is really engage men. And I'd love to ask as you've made a couple comments here about it appropriately advice for newly diagnosed men. And I know your, your office visitation type of uh, communication isn't as frequent, uh, but given uh -huh. What's going on at home right now? Where, what would you say to newly diagnosed men um, with diabetes type 1, 2, 3C, whatever? Yeah. Um, talk about it. That's first and foremost, um, especially communities of color. Um, men don't talk about how they're feeling. They don't talk about their emotions. I mean, every man probably gets diagnosed with diabetes and, and thinks the same thing. Am I going to stop getting erections? Is this going to affect my, you know, sexual performance? What's, what's going to happen? But nobody says anything about it. So when I, was, when I was working in the endocrinology clinic and I would have patients, that's the first thing I would ask them. 
just address the elephant in the room, you know? Um, but men hold things in and it doesn't help. Um, I think now, especially virtually, I mean, I, I do therapy virtually. I, I've tried to, I make my husband do it. He hates it. He says it feels funny. But, <laughs> but I, I think now is the best time, especially because it's virtual. You can either see somebody's face or not, do it over the phone or whatever. Just talk about it. Um, and even if, even if it doesn't get um, to where you're talking about things like that, because that, that probably takes a few sessions to build up the confidence and trust to talk to somebody about like that first and foremost talk about it yeah i agree i agree and that and that's the reason why we you know we kind of blaze this trail with bolus maximus is because we wanted you know we wanted to talk about the tough things like dealing with diabetes is not easy like living with it it's not easy taking on your day-to-day it's not easy it's not easy for anybody but we do understand that men don't necessarily like to talk about it so i we're going to extend that welcome to, to your husband. If he ever wants to join one of our cause, he's more than, more than welcome. You can join our cause as well. Um, you know, because I think sometimes when men hear it from somebody else, I think it hits a little, it hits a little bit harder, you know, and, and I know that you're going to be on your husband just as you are on yourself, just are, just as you are for the community, because at the end of the day, we're all in this together. So speaking of my husband, um, he's finally probably come out of shock. We found out maybe three or four weeks ago. And I will say this to your, to your fellas that are listening. Um, so I'm a little on the plump side, right? My husband is slender, uh, naturally slender, but he is Nigerian and one of the staples in their diet is rice. So he can eat mountains, bowls of rice. Um, he can boil, you know, 10 ears of corn and eat it all. And that's what he has for a meal. And so I have harped for the last three or four years and told him, you need to stop eating all this rice. You got to cut it. We can't keep going through these 10 pound bags of rice. You got to chill with the, with the corn. Now, if I eat a cookie or if I have a popsicle or if I do, oh, it's, you know, you have prediabetes, you know, you, you can't have that. And then it. And he never got the correlation between the carbohydrates and all the corn and the rice and the sweets that I eat occasionally. And so a year ago, I said, I said, you know, you're, you're a point away from the prediabetes range. And he's like, oh, no. You know, he just kind of flaked it off. So we had our physicals, and he's a point away, 6.4. He surpassed me. Uh, from being full-blown, having full-blown type 2 diabetes. He was shooketh. He called me from work. The doctor left some message saying something about diabetes. Will you log into my account and see what's going on? Because I don't know what they're talking about. And now he's finally, uh, like, we, he came home and actually didn't talk to him that night. Because, again, it's just like when you're in the hospital. He was so distraught. I could see him in his face. He wasn't going to take anything in. We didn't even talk about it. I didn't do any kind of education that night. And then the next night and then the next night after that, I gave him a little bit. Same way I would do a patient. I gave him a little bit at a time. But now he understands it was the, it's carbohydrates. It was the carbohydrates. Uh, it's been about a month. His stomach is, I mean, of course, yeah, he's going to lose more weight than me. Um, Cause that's just how it is with men and women diet, but his stomach is already flat. Like he's like, I'm not eating rice for six months. And this was bloating me all this time. And then, you know, he just kept going on. So I will say that to your fellas that's listening, just cause you're slim or you may be in shape or something like that. If you don't have that diet together, that doesn't mean anything. That, that doesn't mean that, anything when it comes to diabetes. I, I don't, I don't mean to be so full and, and this isn't directed at your, I think a lot of men and women, are going to learn some things. It's not the hard way. They're just going to learn it in a way that's very difficult for them to understand. Mm-hmm. That I look at, you know, I've worked in digital advertising. I worked in digital advertising for ten years. Now I now I sell these bad boys. Um, my whole thought process working in digital media was that we are selling things to people who aren't consciously making the decision to do something else. They are just unconsciously doing what you're giving them. And there aren't enough individuals who qualify that type of action and say, you can stop doing this. You, you know, you can eat something else. There's green things. There are leafy greens. 
but that's not directed at, at your husband, but it right. just, it just so happens that it's in, it's not exclusive uh, to the black or brown community. It's not exclusive. Yeah. And, and you look at the Asian community who consumes yeah. a lot of rice as well. So, you know, look overseas, look at where diabetes around the world affects individuals. Yeah. The commercialization of American fast food has put, not that that is what's causing people, but it allows for people to be more lax with what they put in their bodies. And I will say this, because, and that's what he said. He said, I don't understand. I've been eating like this all my life. I said, yeah, but you've been in America four years. I said, you ate all your life like that when you were eating an African diet. You, you have an American diet now, which means occasionally when I don't cook, you're driving through Burger King. He don't, he, he likes, I hate Burger King. He likes Burger King. You're driving through the drive through you know, you're getting the burger and fries. Like you're taking that American diet on top of still trying to eat how you were. And I said, and that, that doesn't work here. And, and I will say this, you said that he, he was shook when he heard that. I, I I think I, I see yeah. like I, I get rocked. I get I get two things out of that. It's like either you want to change or you're like, oh well, like you know, and some people, uh, men specifically, is like, uh, oh well, like it is what it is. I'm gonna I'm gonna continue to do my thing. You know, I would say there's probably even another option. I think people accept that that's what they have to live with, and then just continue yes. doing what they're doing. Yes. That's probably no offense. I yes. think that's probably the majority of people. They're like, I, I get what you're telling me, but because I'm 42 or 55 or 60 years old and you just gave me something totally new, this wagon is going to keep rolling, mm -hmm. whether or not that's... Especially if you, because with diabetes, you can't see the damage. Like the damage is on the inside way before it's on the outside. Amen. So if they, if their body has adjusted to, you know, feeling like crap, they don't even really know what it feels to feel good anymore. They're not going to think anything different. True. Very true. But I will say that I've had, I've, I've, I spoke at a conference last year about diabetes and afterwards this gentleman and his wife, he was a, a pastor and his wife came up to me and he said, you know, that was a good presentation, but I got to ask you a question. My brother and my sister and my mom and my dad, they all had diabetes and one lost their leg and I don't have diabetes yet. And he was so baffled that he did not have it and what was wrong with him? And so, you know, it's, it goes to say what you were saying, Matt, I think, especially when we're talking about in the black community specifically, if you, if you're, if a lot of people in your family have diabetes, uh, whether it's type one or type two, it's almost a given. It's like a rite of passage. And if I don't get it, what the, what's going on? They just assume they're going to get it. Yeah, Brandon, we had, I mean, probably one of the better conversations ever that Brandon and I have had. We had what this week, last week or this week, yeah. and it specifically had to do with access to insulin and access to uh, quality food. And, you know, we really started talking about the fact that Brandon just started doing a study. There's not a lot of, well, you said it before, there aren't a lot of black and brown people. I haven't been in any studies. There, there, there are, I'm, I'm currently in <laughs> one right now. And I had this discussion, literally, it took me 17 years to get in one. And I'm not going to say I haven't tried to get in one, but just it didn't, it didn't line up at, at the, the timing wasn't good enough for me to get in one. And the majority of them, when I tried to get in them, they were uh, specifically at the University of Michigan. I, I go green, go green. I had to say that as a follow-up because I'm a Michigan State guy. But I wanted to do a study and... All they, they, they only offered type two diabetic studies. So I never really could get involved in one. But now that I have the opportunity to, I want to continue to spread that to other people. Some people may not want to. Some people that look, a lot of people that look like me, no, I'm not doing that. But the reason for me doing it is because I want to be able to share that. Like, look, this is the technology that's coming forward. This is what they're doing. This is what they're improving because you need to have that voice that goes along with it because if you just hear it, a research study, you're like, I'm not doing that. Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? Like, you don't, people's ambitions, like I'm not about to get involved in a research study, but it, it, it actually is kind of cool to see all the things that go on behind the scenes that people don't get to see. Yeah. I love that. I'm so glad. And I can't wait to see what comes out of that. Another thing I will say that I'm glad that you're doing, I'm glad that for both of you doing what you're doing is, um, and I, and I said something to JDR about this as well. Like we see the little celebrity, you know, commercials and the little celebrity spots, but I think we live in a, in a, 
society now where people like seeing regular people do stuff. Yeah. And like, you're just, you're a regular guy and, and, and that will resonate with people. And I'm a regular, you know, black woman and that resonates with people. And so for me, I'm, I'm glad that you're doing that. And then that message will come from you. And then they'll say, Oh, you know, I can, I, I can, I can probably do a study or something. Brandon's doing one. So that is wonderful. That is really good news to hear. Now that's a jumping off point for us to continue that conversation to talk like you mentioned before, one of the issues is access or, or at least knowledge or the understanding of what products are available, how to get them. As I've worked now for, for Tandem for a little while, I have phone conversations with individuals every day about their insurance. You call Tandem to get a pump, you, you talk to me. And my responsibility is to help walk you through what you can and cannot do. And the amount of patients who I speak with, who I'm like, oh, I feel so bad. You're in a bind, you're in warranty, all the stuff. It is challenging. And we, you know, it's a small percentage of the diabetes community that actually uses these devices. There's still a lot of people that don't use it. Mm-hmm. So, or don't know that their insurance even, you know, allows it. Exactly. I can't tell you how many people I've connected with through Facebook or Instagram or any of the other channels beyond type one, some of the other channels that I've been involved with and explain to them. Now, I I personally, I I grew up having medical insurance and my father was a doctor. My mother was a nurse. I was, I basically lived in a hospital, Mm -hmm. you know, in, in a way where I was diagnosed. I was in the hospital for two days. I was discharged. I had my, my medical team was at home. So I had a very different background than a lot of people. And when I look at where I'm at now, I went through in the last couple of years going to Medicaid because I didn't have insurance. I didn't have a job in California and paying out of pocket for insulin and being in the humbling experience. It, I I don't, when it happened, when all the things happened that I went through, I was like, I'm what I'm, I can't even be mad. Mm -hmm. I'm angry at the fact that this is the damn system that this is what people live with. And the fact that I felt like I climbed to one of the tallest branches in the tree and then I had my feet on the ground again, looking up and going, everybody who's still climbing, they're, they're, they're not even, they're, they don't know how much more that they can yeah. get. They don't know what's up there. Yeah. And so that's, that's one of the reasons. Brandon and I started talking a couple of years ago to start this and uh, you know, having you as somebody who started diversity and diabetes we see what well, we feel like there's a lot of correlation between what we're doing and some of the individuals we've spoken with. So we, we truly are excited to help give back, you know, and, and help diversify the diabetes community um, and, and the outlook for it. And I, I want to piggyback off of what Matt just said, because, you know, like you said, Quisha, it was a very humbling experience for him to have that, to, to kind of be, have those doctors in house. And then, you know, go a majority of his life with that insurance. Look, I listened to you talk to Kendall, uh, Kendall Simmons, and I listened to him and I almost shed a tear because I, I felt where he was coming from as far as that he knew that he could do more, he knew that he could give back, but also being sheltered. I know what it was to play football and not have to go outside of the training staff to get what I needed. And for me, that woke me up to make me realize, like, I've been protected. Like, I, you know, n- not now. I'm not like that now. But I realized, like, I, I was very fortunate. I was very privileged. And, you know, after working in the city of Detroit and working exclusively with diabetics and seeing the shape that they were in, and we're talking about teenagers, we're talking about 13, 14, 15, 16 years old, it made me realize, like, even though I've been doing a lot, I have to do more. Like, because there's a huge void. And people don't understand the system is broken, like it's broken. And somehow we have to figure out how do we come together to fix that. And, and I'll say it, I've said it before and I'll say it again. This disease doesn't discriminate against anybody. But what you see is you see a lot of people that don't have an abundance of resources or education or a network that are being affected. And now if we can catch that in the beginning and, and, and give them the tools that they need, then we won't see all of these complications later on down the road because hopefully they'll take the initiative and understand like they can, they can live a long, healthy, successful life long as they have the tools. And sometimes it's hard 
to get to the tools or get the access to things because they don't know where to get it from. So, you know, what you're doing is amazing. And I, I can't, I can't say more than enough. Like, I just can't say more than enough about that. Um, how can, I mean, how can members of the community learn more about the diversity uh, and diabetes? That's a great question. I don't know when we plan on going live with this, but hopefully the website will be up uh, very soon. <laughs> we, we, we got the domain, so they can check us out at diversityanddiabetes.org. Um, so one of the things, and I love everything that you just said, but one of the ways we thought, how can we scale this as quick as we can? And so uh, what we will be doing in 2021 um, is developing an ambassador, diversity ambassador program, where we have people like you, Brandon, and like you, Matt, and other people um, around the, hopefully around the globe, um, that are well-versed in what's going on with diversity issues uh, as it relates to Blacks, Indigenous, and people of color. Um, so that we can keep this conversation going. You know, it's like you said when you were talking about the patients that, you know, you're, you're working with that don't know about their resources and insurance. And um, there, there's so much, if you just know the information, if you just know where to access the resource, mm -hmm. your life can be so much better. And so well, having <laughs> um, what we believe to have ambassadors that are not only aware of um, the situation and what's going on, but then also can be able to point people in the right direction. And, and whether that's, you know, having a point person in a, in a church or in a community center or whatever it may be, um, we really think that's going to be one of the, the best ways to kind of scale um, our focus areas to reach the most people. I'm excited to see that launch for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's going to be, be, be really good. That's powerful. That's very cool. And so, not to switch gears, but then what's on the horizon for your people of color living with diabetes? Okay, so that's an annual thing. We've talked about that, right? We're actually going to start planning that six months out. Um, and we want to have um, a lot more diversity. So when we surveyed uh, attendees, we did get some really good feedback. And we do want to have more diversity. So we want to have people from all over the world, different cultures, um, different countries. Um, but also we want to highlight grassroots efforts, which I don't think a lot of organizations do. That's great. Um, That's great. <laughs> yeah, we want, That's there are a lot of people doing good work, but you don't see, you just see the banquets and the fundraisers and the, yeah, you know, like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so we want to highlight the work that just common day average every day people are doing. And then if there are studies like the one that you're in, Brandon, that, you know, are reaching out, intentionally reaching out to people of color to bring them in, we want to showcase that type of stuff. We want to hear those initiatives that are happening. So we plan to do a lot more spotlighting um, on those type of things for 2021. I, I will say for the study that I'm in, uh, they didn't reach out to me though, but uh, <laughs> somebody that I know that's in the community uh, that, that we know, uh, won't say his name, uh, but he reached out to me and he knew I had some interest in it and he brought it to me and I was knocking at their door the next day. Like, <laughs> Hey, let me in, let me in. So uh, I love that. But you know what? They need to start reaching out. I think it's been every talk I hear, you hear the same thing. Like, Oh, black people don't, don't trust the healthcare system. And everybody remembers Tuskegee and okay, we can use that as an excuse and it could be the truth and an excuse but still knock on my door, you know, be, be like the census people, still knock on my door. I've had five census people. I'm like, I gave the last one the information, you know, be that consistent. For sure, for if sure, let, really, let me choose, let me, let yeah, me. Decide. If you really want, you know, a diverse representation in your population, then dab, dab, be persistent. Don't just ask one time, um, find somebody that looks like me to ask, you know. For sure, and I wanna, I wanna say this too, because you said you wanted, to be more diverse, you know, different countries, different cultures. Look, don't don't discredit what you did because your lineup that you had, I mean, you had Kyleen Redman, you had Kendall Simmons, you had Dan Newman, you had uh it, it, it I don't want to pronounce her name wrong. Is it is it Myla Clark? 
um Mila, Mila Clark Mila, Buckley. Mila, mm-hmm. Yes. You know what I mean? So like you you just jump right in. You know, you jump right in and you know it's like I don't care what you think that I'm doing. I'm doing you know why you're doing it. Like when that my the first conversation I ever had with you, I was like, man, you know what? We we're gonna we getting along, like we gonna rock this thing, you know? And it's not about, I think people think about, it's all about the dollars. They think it's all about, um, you know, that they got to stay in one specific lane. Like I said, this diabetes thing, it affects everybody. It affects families. It, it affects children. It affects teenagers. It affects people being uh, diagnosed at late onset. You know, we're here in the community to help everybody. Oh, I forgot. Uh, Chelsea, I forgot about Chelsea. Oh, Chelsea right. yeah. <laughs> I can't, yeah. I can't leave Chelsea out. Uh, yeah, but no, please don't Chelsea, leave Chelsea right. out. <laughs> um, but, uh, but, but I will say, uh, when I talk about diversity, because I do believe that you can't be a member of a marginalized community and not respect all marginalized communities. True. true and true. so when I talk about diversity, you know, our panel was overwhelmingly Black or African American uh, for this summit this year. So, um, you know, I would like to see some some Asian Americans. I would like to see, um, you know, a, a more uh, Latinx. I would like to even have people um, that identify as like lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender. You know, I I I want to have. Di- when I say diversity, I mean it has to be diverse. But the fact that you started somewhere, like yeah. for uh, for 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 somebody like me, that goes a long way. And, yeah. and your your mission isn't only to help black people. It's to help all people, you know, yes. and, and I heard you say that uh, in, in one of the interviews, you know, your your focus isn't just black people. It's everybody. Mm-hmm. It's not it's not saying that, oh, no, you're white. You can't come to this table. Oh, no, you're Indian. You can't come to this table. Oh, you're Asian. You can't. Oh, you're Arab. No, that's that's not what you're saying. You're saying that you want to encompass everybody that that deals with diabetes, no matter what. So, you know, like I. I I, I'm I'm just super excited to see where this thing goes. <laughs> we, 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 like the whole, I, I, Brandon and I had this conversation the other day. You just brought up a really good point. Uh, we, we've been pushing uh, males. We're, we're talking about men. Uh, we are men with diabetes. And uh, we had a great question uh, last week from a woman who reached out, who was interested in, in communicating to some of her fellow friends and, and diabetic uh, buddies. Uh, that that there was something like bolus maximus, but they asked very specifically. It was open to you know the LBGT community, and I said, of course. I said we we just represent humans with diabetes, yeah. like that's it. You you come here. You have diabetes. You come here. You want a hug? We'll hug you. Come here. Like that is that is where we're operating from. That is the basis of our operation. Uh, we know that not everybody can be helped. We know that not everybody is looking or willing to accept help. We're still shining the light. We're here. Yeah, we're we're, we're coming here. to find you. So. I love that. I'm glad. We've got to be open, man. I mean, it's it's 2020, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so I will say, before 2021, we're obviously going to have to have another conversation, Quisha, because we have a whole page worth of notes here that seem like more like follow-up questions. Uh, this was an extremely fruitful conversation. I think a lot of people will understand a little bit better that these are topics that need to be talked about, they need to be examined, and then they really need to be pushed forward. And, yeah. and, and the innovation right now in the diabetes space, it, it is operating outside of the community because technology and what is developed by you know, those major companies, let's, let's hold the community's hand. And we are excited to be having that communication with you and, and just starting here and, and what we're gonna be doing in the future. So thank, sure. thank you, thank yeah. you, thank you, thank, thank you, thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I, I want you to, uh, be, before we get off, I want you to let people know where they can find you as far as your website, as far as your Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Go ahead. Get, get, this, is, this is the time to, to plug everything right here. So um, right now, you can find anything related to diversity and diabetes um, at POCLWD. Um, as you can imagine, we're going through quite a bit of change. Uh, Because our nonprofit is actually diversity and diabetes, but we've been going by people of color living with diabetes on everything. But find us there at POCLWD. Me personally, you can find me uh, at Umemba Health, U-M-E-M-B-A Health, and that's on all social media platforms. 
And, and you have merch, merch too. Yes, 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 I have merch. Just follow me on one of my sites. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I have all the things, all the things going on. I, we, I just, we I'm a blood for punishment. No. <laughs> well, thank you, Precia. We are so excited to have had this conversation today and and end, the, end this week like like this. And thank you. So we'll be looking forward to our next conversation. We, Brandon and I say something, you know, each week, we've been saying it to each other for a while, but uh, we, we say it to the rest of our group and then anybody that joins, we, we say, keep it 100. Uh, it, it's twofold, right? Like you, you really want to try to keep your blood sugar in a reasonable range. That's probably somewhere around hundred. You just don't always have to keep a straight face when you do it, just keep it real. So be real in your effort. Uh, and if you have a frowny face, that's okay. Just strive for that, that good blood sugar. And um, if you need okay. help, <laughs> my dog's in the background shaking his head. Okay. He's got a cone on. He's got a cone on and he's not very happy. Oh, poor, poor baby. Yeah. So actually he, he works with me. So he, he can smell the change, the chemical change in my body, Brandon's body that I, that I don't feel uh, at all. So I, that's, that's, right. a, that's another, totally another conversation, but if anybody listening needs help, uh, you know where to find us, Bolus Maximus, Bolus.Maximus um, on Instagram and Facebook right now. We have the Bolus Maximus at gmail.com and on the lookout very soon, or be on the lookout very soon for a website uh, and, and some more things to be coming up. So Brandon and I have, have really made some headway and, and this is exciting. And thank you, Krisha, for joining thank, us tonight. Thank, thank you. you. And as thank always, you. keep it, keep it 100. Yeah, keep on hurry. Quisha, have a great night. We'll we'll talk to you very soon. Take care. Same to you too. Bye-bye. 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 If you don't know, now you know. Bullets Maximus is not sponsored by anybody. But if you would like to get involved or sponsor a podcast, please reach out to us at the Maximus at gmail.com. That is the T H E B O L U S M A X I M U S at Gmail or through our website, bolus, B-O-L-U-S-M dot org. That is www.bolusm.org. We also have an Instagram, Facebook, and a YouTube channel. Please feel free to reach out.